Okay, 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 okay. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to say uh, this event uh, is carrying 0.2 uh, CPD credits from EXA. For those who are stream, uh, for those who are streaming this event, it's at 0.2. So let us continue uh, streaming live this event so that we can able to claim our 0.2 from EXA. Thanks very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, President, the council member. Uh, Mr. Luzan Shitai, who's always available during our events in Jobek or Houting, Dr. Yates, Prof. Rees, all our members from Western Cape to Pumalanga, who are stream, streaming this event, to Prof. Ray, to Prof. Senior, Protocol Observe. My name is Ansel Melembe. It is my honor and pleasure to serve as a CEO of a South African Institute of Mechanical Engineering. And it is my privilege to master the proceeding of this event. Our order of the proceeding this evening will be as follows. We will um, first hear an official welcome from a Vets University delivered by Prof. Uh, Reid. He's the head of mechanical, industrial, and aeronautical engineering. He will give us um, a history and the significance of the John Orr lecture. I will then call the guest um, speaker, and I will introduce this topic. After enjoying the lecture, we will be given an opportunity to ask limited questions. Then the last thing will be our president, Ms. Poshia Mugetla, who's here will be um, giving an, uh, uh, expressing uh, uh, thanks and appreciation and close the event. Without wasting time, we have to move with the supersonic speed. I will invite Prof. Reid to come up front to welcome the audience and speak on the history and the significance of the lecture. Over to you, Prof. Professor Matthew Celier, Ms. Portia Moketla, Mr. Ansel Malembe, and council members of the South African Institute of Mechanical Engineering, senior executive team members of the university, members of the industry advisory board of the School of Mechanical, Industrial, and Aeronautical Engineering, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and privilege to welcome you all to the John Orr Lecture this evening. The purpose of this occasion is to honour Professor John Orr, who was an icon of engineering education in South Africa from the turn of the previous century through to the 1950s. John Orr was born in Scotland in 1870 and obtained a BSc in both mechanical and electrical engineering in 1893 from the University of Glasgow which is incidentally the alma mater also of James Watt. In 1897, he moved to South Africa and in 1898 became the professor of mechanical engineering at the newly established Kimberley School of Mines. This school ultimately became the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg and he became the first head of the School of Mechanical Engineering, which eventually became the current School of Mechanical Industrial and aeronautical engineering. In 1925, Professor Orr left the university to dedicate himself to establishing a sound technical education for apprentices and artisans. His vision led to the establishment of the Witwatersrand Technical Institute, of which he became director and first chairman of council. The Witwatersrand Technical Institute was renamed the Witwatersrand Technical College in 1930, undergoing a series of name changes until such time as it was merged into the University of Johannesburg as Technikon Witwatersrand. John Orr's contributions to technical education were foundational, as were many other achievements that time does not permit me to touch with. 
highlights, however, would probably be his receiving the King's Silver Medal in 1935 and the King's Coronation Medal in 1937 and an honorary degree of Doctor of Laws conferred on him by the University of the Witwatersrand in 1936. He finally retired from the directorship of the Witwatersrand Technical College in 1945 and passed away in 1954. His name and legacy have been perpetuated through, firstly, the John Orr Technical High School, secondly, the John Orr Wing of the Laboratory Building in the School of Mechanical, Industrial and Aeronautical Engineering at Wits University, and thirdly, of course, this, the prestigious John Orr Lecture to which you will shortly be treated. This was initiated to honor him and commemorate his achievements in engineering education in South Africa. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Prof. Thanks very much. Uh, it's that time of the day where we have to introduce our guest speaker of the day. Our guest speaker is Prof. Uh, Celia. Is coming from the country that we have played uh, rugby with. It was a final <laughs> match recently. So we've been chasing him. We didn't invite him now. We started somewhere in April, I mean, to, to ask him to come and give this lecture. So it's not that, that we have won the World Cup. We bring him to South Africa. And unfortunately, we're celebrating today, but yeah, but it's a football man, it's not a rugby man, so we're not going to add him on that. Uh, Prof. Celia graduated with a master's in, in modeling and simulation in mechanics from University Grenoble Alps in France in 2000. Then he got his PhD from the University of Leeds in the UK in 2003, working on the development of numerical method to better understand the flow of thin liquid films and droplets on complex textured surfaces for coating application. In 2006, he started as a lecturer in the theoretical fluid mechanics in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Canterbury and became a professor in fluid mechanics in 2018. He currently leads the Interfaces and Inverse Problems Lab as a highly accomplished uh, fluid dynamics and a leader in the field of them, thermofluid mechanics. He has, he has, uh, he has uh, spearheaded numerous groundbreaking research projects, co-authored more than 180 publications, and secured loans to 3.5 million US dollars in external research funding. Some of the key research projects he has led include the following, using, simu using simulation-based optical flow control to deliver a step change in coating technology by enabling and the reliable coating of curved surfaces to developing an, an innovative uh, technique to measure in suit and in real time the rheology of lava or other ge geophysical uh, fluids from a free surface observ observation. Three, using modeling and simulation to share valuable new insights on the spray drying process for milk powder production. The last one, developing new open microfluidics platform based on the cell propulsion of drop, droplets. He leads a strong research group, has mentored several early career researchers and has supervised over 25 PhD students, helping them develop into independent researchers. He has received a fellowship stay at Oxford University, the National Institute of Applied Science in Toulouse in France, and the National Institute of Technology in Calcut in India. His contribution to the fluid mechanics community in New Zealand and beyond was recently recognized by his award of a fellowship of engineering New Zealand. Since 2019, he has, since 2019, he is a head of uh, the Mechanical Engineering Department at, at UC, that's in place of Canterbury, which is ranked second in New Zealand. Under his tenure, the, the department has experienced a significant growth in students and staff due to its strong reputation for training engineers with a strong understanding of engineering sciences and hands-on skills. In his spare time, he loves to spend time with his family 
touring and exploring New Zealand and playing football while he can still. You see, I've already told you, I knew. That I knew. And then the last one, I just want to breathe down on your abstract. Then this abstract, I just want to quickly read this abstract of this um, session. Many flows encountered in our daily lives involve a moving boundary. The shape of a raindrop, for example, evolves as, a, as, it, as it falls through the air. Likewise, the free surface of a river deforms as it counters obstacles. While the mathematical ingredients required to describe such flows have been known since the late 19th century and are, re and are, are encapsulated in the Navia, the Navia Stokes equation, solving complex flows with a moving boundary or interfaces still possess, possesses significant challenges and pro provides stimulating cross-disciplinary research, research opportunities for which mechanical engineers have much to contribute. The question at the center of this lecture is inverted commas. If information about the interface dynamics are available, can we indirectly interfere with known properties of the flow? Such question falls in the realm of the inverse problems of for which one knows the effect but is looking for the cause. Specifically, the presentations about how it, it, it is possible to estimate fluids properties from limited observation, how to control the flow around hydrofoils to mitigate cavitation, or what is the best way to rotate a pen to cook uh, the perfect crepe. Professor Celia, on behalf of South African Institute of Mechanical Engineering and Vets University, I invite you to present the John O. 2023 Memorial Lecture titled Fascinating Thin Films, Bubbles, and Droplets from Microfluidics to Geophysical Flows. Give him a round of applause. Thank you very much for this, uh, this kind of introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure and uh, honor to, uh, to, to present this uh, lecture today. And um, yes, I'd like to, to thank the S South African Institute of Mechanical Engineering and Wits University and Professor Ho for being a, 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 a great host whilst I've been uh, here. So before I, I dive into the technical details of my presentation, uh, I hope you allow me to digress a little bit because uh, of course, this afternoon uh, we had Springbok uh, only a few hundred meters away, which was really, really exciting, but also a little bit bittersweet for me. So I just sort of, I, I spent a couple of minutes telling you a little bit about my background. So um, I'm from France origin originally, as you may have uh, gathered already. And I've grown there, done all, all my undergraduate studies. So of course, when the quarterfinal came along, I was 100% for supporting the French team. And South Africa sort of broke uh, our, our initial uh, dreams, beating France by, by one point. Following, following that, um, I traveled to the UK where I did my, P, my, my, my PhD, and um, actually I met my wife and started a family, and therefore uh, it was kind of my second home. And of course, in the semi-final, we played England. I was supporting England. What happened? You all know what happened. <laughs> uh, England beat by one point. Um, following that, um, uh, we went to, to Germany. So Germany, there's not too much rugby happening, so no drama there. Uh, but following from that, of course, uh, back, uh, back in 2006, uh, we, we moved with my family to, to, to New Zealand. And of course, I don't need to tell you that rugby is a religion in New Zealand. So when the final came along, you know, I was cheering for the All Blacks, of course. And, um, and again, South Africa came winning. So, you know, that goes to show how far three points can go. So I can only say, well, 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 well done, the Springboks. So, um, oh, let's get into the um, more, um, well, I guess the, the details of my talk. So, so I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, my, my two main research areas, uh, which um, the first one is to do with um, modeling free surface flows or flows with a, an interface, the likes of uh, you see that down here. Uh, big, uh, I guess one of the motivations, I, I think they're just beautiful flows even by themselves, but they also present a lot of challenges in terms of uh, modeling and, uh, and understanding what's happening. So um, uh, some of the things I like to do is you, use uh, numerical simulation to, to, to understand what happens to... So here we've got a droplet uh, falling on the surface for, uh, for spray drying. So I, I've, I, over the years, I've um, 
looked at a number of applications uh, ranging from uh, here we've got um, glass manufacturing, so uh, for um, pro the production of lens. Uh, things like, um, um, I don't know if the video is going to play, um, forensic science, so how a droplet falls on the surface and, and forms a, a blood stain is an, is an interesting problem. Um, so here we've got a droplet falling in a, in a spray dryer, uh, and understanding the dynamic of this, this droplet is a, is a challenging um, thing. Um, the other area of interest of uh, mine is what, what's referred to uh, sometimes as inverse problems. And uh, the way I like to, to present it usually is, uh, is, is um, through forensic science. Uh, so forensic science, I'm sure you, you know a little bit about it. Uh, you know, if you've got a crime scene like we have here on the left-hand side, uh, a bit of blood is shed. And uh, the, when the blood falls on the surface, it, it produces a stain. And, um, Understanding sort of the, the process whereby we go from the, the blood droplet being uh, uh, formed and the blood stain uh, appearing is what we refer to as a direct problem. And it's, it's usually, it's challenging, but uh, it's usually something that we can do by solving things like the Navier-Stokes equation like we've got here. The, the thing that is much more challenging, and that's what forensic science li li scientists like to do, is to go from this blood stain here and try to understand what happened at, at, at the crime scene. And um, this is a problem that is a lot more difficult. And usually to solve this problem, you need a couple of things. You need observations, the likes of this blood, this blood stain here. And you need some kind of models that is able to predict um, how we go from the, the crime scene to the, to the, to the blood stain. So um, today, I, uh, oh, I'll just uh, show a couple of, well, some examples I've been working on over the years, uh, including, including gla glacier flows, for which it's very easy to measure what things that happens at the free surface, but much more difficult to understand what's happening at the, at the bedrock. So we've developed methods that allow us to infer bedrock information from what we observe at the free surface. We've done similar things with, for river flows. And what we see down at the bottom here is um, boundary layer control. So we've got the flow of our cylinder here going left to right, and we've got vort vortex shedding. That's quite a classical um, a fluid flow phenomena. And we see that when we apply some suction, which is the, those red um, arrows that you can see, we can basically completely eliminate the, um, the vortex shedding and therefore reduce the, reduce the drag. Um, so this is, so today, um, I'm hoping to present to you uh, at least two of the recent problems I've been working on, um, which kind of combines those two interests, sort of interfacial fluid dynamics and uh, an inverse problem. So I'll get started with the first one, which is to do with uh, remote uh, rheometry. And really what we were interested in is whether it's possible to um, evaluate the rheometry, the, the, the rheology, sorry, of a fluid, just by looking at how it, uh, how it flows. So this is a project I've been working on on a number of years with colleagues from the University of Canterbury, uh, from um, um, geology, for example, because the, the ultimate goal was to apply these kind of techniques to, uh, to lava flows. And uh, I've got collaborators at uh, INSA in Toulouse. And um, uh, uh, yeah. so I guess the, to illustrate uh, what we're interested in, um, as, uh, I think the, what hap what's happening in this test tube um, is, a good, is a good example. So, so the, the, in this test tube, we've got various fluids. Um, all those, those uh, fluids are obviously subject to the same body force, gra gravity, but you can clearly see that the flow here is very different. Um, and um, and the, the question we'd like to answer is, is it possible just to look at the, the, the shape of those flows and say something about the rheology of the, uh, of the fluid? Of course, rheology, the, the, the science of how things flow, is very important in a number of contexts uh, for food productions. Here we've got pa pasta extrusions. Uh, food processing. Um, here we've got uh, in construction. This is actually uh, concrete pouring uh, at the University of Canterbury, um, or manufacturing so, such as uh, such as glass manufacturing that we've got here. So typically, of course, if you're interested in rheology, what you would do is put your your fluid in a rheometer and uh, apply a certain torque and see how um, how quickly your your it rotates, and that, that, will, that would give you some information uh, about, the, about the rheology. I, I actually, a small, this is a little bit, um, this is a student sort of uh, illustration, but uh, for, for people who are not 
very familiar with rheology, I find, I find it quite, quite useful. Uh, so if we had a block here with a certain mass uh, that's sort of sliding on a layer of fluid with a velocity, let's say, v, V1, um, and um, so it's sliding with a certain velocity, if we made the, 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 the mass uh, twi twi twice as big, the, the question is, uh, what would the velocity V2 be? Okay, so that's, uh, if I were in a lecture theater giving a proper lecture, I would expect you to answer that, but I'll just answer that for you. Uh, basically, if we had a new, if this fluid was Newtonian, purely Newtonian, then, then the, the block would slide at twice the velocity. Uh, but uh, many fluids are not Newtonian, so some of them are shear thickening, and therefore the, 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 the viscosity increases as you increase the, the shear rate, and therefore the velocity of the second block would be smaller than twice the velocity of the first block. And some fluids are shear thinning, that means the viscosity decreases um, as, you, uh, as you increase the shear, and therefore V2 would be greater than twice uh, V1. So, um, how this is portrayed um, in a, in a uh, flow, flow curve, this is what we call a flow curve here. So we've got the viscosity V here as a function of the, of the shear rate. And for Newtonian flow, we have a constant viscosity. Uh, for, um, for a shear thickening uh, fluid, you can think of a corn starch, starch for example. Uh, we've got... Um, uh, so, uh, so that's a dilatant fluid, and we've got the viscosity that increased. This is the blue curve here. And for a shear thinning fluid, think about uh, paint, for example, um, and so the, the, the viscosity decreases. So this is described by what is known as a power law. Uh, this is what we've got here. And this power law needs two parameters to be identified, K, which is a consistency factor, and N, which is a, a flow behavior index. Okay. So um, coming back to the motivation, why would you want just to... Um, basically infer the rheology just by looking at how it flows is, is because there are many flows um, in nature but also in industry where um, you, 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 you basically are not able to use a rheometer to measure the, the, the rheology. So here I've got landslides, for example, which are a collection of um, inhomogeneous blocks, so clearly you can't put that in a rheometer. Lava is a very hot and toxic material. You cannot put that in a rheometer. Sometimes the samples are just too small, such as aerosol particles. So, so all of this, uh, you could not use a standard rheometer. Okay? So the hypothesis at the start of what we were trying to do is because when you've got a, a, a flow such as this one, which is bounded by an interface, um, basically perturbation in the flow will be transferred to the interface. So what we'd like to be able to do is say, well, can we, just by looking at those perturbations in the, the, the interface, say something about the flow? And one of the pictures that inspired us is, is this one from a paper in, back in 20, 2015, which shows basically lava flows around an obstacle with a velocity field here inferred at the free surface. And, and so, so we try to infer the rheology from such um, images. In order to test, um, well, to develop a methodology and test it, we started with um, a well-controlled experiment, which is, uh, which is called the dam break problem. And it's, it's a very simple, uh, well, it's a classical problem in fluid mechanics, whereby we've got a, a, a fluid, basically two pools of fluids which are separated by a gate that we see here. And um, at a certain time, the gate is pulled up, and obviously the, 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 the fluid flows from the, the high level to the, to, the, to the low level. And so the... In order to track the velocity of the free surface, we seeded the, the free surface with, uh, with, with, with beads. And uh, the, the trajectory of these beads were, were recorded, from which we could do particle tracking velocimetry and say something about the, the free surface velocity. So this is the kind of pictures that we get here. This, these are the trajectories of the, of the beads from which we can uh, deduce a, a velocity field. So this velocity field here, is near the gate of the dam break. So very near the break, as soon as you pull it up, you've got high velocity because there's a high difference in, in levels. And uh, as the, the level become um, increasingly equal, the velocity decreases. So this is what we see here. So the black curve is at a very initial time. So we've got high velocity. And uh, at the other extreme, we've got the green curve here. When you wait long enough, um, uh, the, the fluid becomes more level, there's less um, hydrostatic pressure to drive the flow and therefore less, less velocity. So this, this is what will constitute our observations for the inverse problem. 
Then we also need a model. Okay, so the model obviously requires some equations, and I'm not going to go. Um, I've already heard this more, uh, a few min minutes ago that uh, um, Navier-Stokes equations were, were a bit of scary equations. So I'm not. Gonna, I'm, not uh, I'm sure those of you who have done mechanical engineering will remember the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, but and the, the important thing to remember here is that so this is what we solve in order to calculate the the, the evolution of the free surface here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but what we need to feed in this model is the power law rheology. So we need to feed in a consistency factor and, and a flow be behavior uh, in index. These are our unknowns, basically. And in order to um, identify those unknowns, uh, what we are going to do um, is basically um, use an optimization method that minimizes the difference between the observations and the, 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 the free surface velocity that we calculate uh, in the flow. So this is basically what this formula here says. So we've got this objective function OF, which depends on K and N, the rheological parameters, and we try to minimize, find the K and N which minimizes this, uh, this objective function. So um, the, one of the things we always do when we start developing those algorithms is do something which is sometimes called the twin experiments. So that means that basically you generate some, some data using your, your, um, your, 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 your simulations uh, for, for a given set of uh, parameters. So in that particular case, we've picked n equal 0.7 and k equal 0.4. We generate some data. We just pretend that they are like uh, experimental data. And then we start the identification process to see if we can recover those, uh, um, those, those uh, rheological parameters. What you see here on, the, on this graph is basically a map of the objective function uh, as a function of the two parameters of this problem, which are, which are n and k. And what you see here is that there is a clear minimum that is located just here. And this minimum, as you, as you expect, is, uh, is precisely the solution that we're looking for. Now, this may seem obvious, but actually, um, there's no guarantee that the problem is well posed. You could have a, an objective function which has got multiple minima, and therefore you don't really know which one to pick. So this is giving us the, 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 the hope and confidence that the problem we're trying to solve is indeed well posed. So then we, we, uh, we tested it with um, uh, actual experimental data, and uh, the, 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 the fluid was uh, aqueous glycerol for which uh, we've got the flow curves here, so it turns out it's Newtonian rheology with n equal 1 and k equal 1.17. And again, uh, when we, um, so when we apply the optimization, again, we see a clear minimum of the objective function at this location, and the minimum is uh, located at n equal 1 and k equal 1.13. So, so it does indicate that the, the, the idea, the concept, and the, uh, the, the algorithm does what we expect it to do. Um, this is just comparing the velocities, the free surface velocities um, at various times. Um, you see those symbols represents the, the measurements, and the, the, the curves represents the simulation. So for the optimal parameters, we see that the two are in good agreement, which is uh, an indication of the success of the algorithm. Um, so I guess just to wrap up this first uh, part of the talk, um, this basically that confirms that the free surface contains a lot of information which can be used to, to uh, say something about the, the, the rheology uh, of the fluid. And there, there are some challenges, including um, it requires high quality observations, good models that can be solved effectively and quickly, and um, uh, a priori assumptions related to the nature of the, of the rheology. Um, so, as I said before, and uh, we've made um, the, the, the ultimate goal is to apply these techniques to LAVA. So we're, we're working on this at the moment, uh, and uh, we've had some success recently. So, so, so LAVA has a bit more complicated rheology because it's got a yield stress, which means that the, um, as well as those two parameters K and N, you also need to infer an additional parameters, which is the, the amount of stress that you need to apply before flow starts to um, starts to occur. All right, the second problem I'm going to talk about uh, maybe started as a bit of a um, blue sky idea, but did turn out into, a, uh, I think, um, important application in the, in the world of coating. So, so what I'm going to talk about now is, is about covering a surface with, with a uniform layer. And um, 
Um, and this is where the, the pancake and the coating comes from. So uh, on the left-hand side here, you see, um, I don't know how you make your pancake in South Africa, but in France, we, 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 we put the, the, the butter in the middle of the pan, and then you start rotating your pan, and you, you hope that in the end you've got a, a, the butter that covers your pan perfectly and uniformly. That's the goal, uh, usually. Uh, but the same, you, you've got the same goal when you do deep coating. So deep coating, you, you, you basically, basically plunge your surface in a liquid, you pull it out, and uh, by doing so, you cover your surface by, by, the, by, by, your, by your thin liquid film. And the same problem occurs. You need, to, you need to coat it with a uniform layer, which is, um, which is not straightforward. So, um, so we were uh, interested in this problem, which we, which we solved uh, basically as... Um, Usually those flows are slow flows, so, so we can basically treat them as, um, we can basically uh, ignore um, sort of conviction and assume that the, the, the flow is purely driven uh, by, uh, by gravity, okay? And so we've got um, a coordinate system that is attached to the, to the, to the plane, and as you move and rotate this, uh, this plane, um, the orientation of gravity is going to vary relative to this plane, and this is what is going to drive the flow um, over, the, over the surface. Um, in order to model the, model the solidification process, we, we have a viscosity which is effectively uh, temperature dependent. Okay? So the, the, the controls in this problem are the orientation of the, the, of the surface uh, relative to, to gravity, because this is the driving force. Those, uh, the, this, this orientation of the surface is, the, is governed by two angles, beta and theta, which are functions of time. So um, the problem we are trying to solve is what are the optimal, what's the optimal kinematics, so what's the optimal way of moving your surface in order to spread uniformly your, your, your coating on the, on, the, on the surface. So um, I won't bore you too much with the, the equations, but I, I, I have to explain you a few, a few things. Um, so, of course, uh, in terms of hydrodynamics, we have conservation of momentum and conservation of, uh, of mass. Um, and conservation of momentum, because we neglect inertia, we've basically just a flow that is a balance between viscous stresses, which is what we've got on the left, and hydrostatic pressure gradient, which is the second term, and this term, which is due to gravity, and it is, it is this term that is be a, going to be a function of time, and that is going to be the control um, in, this, uh, in this problem. Um, we've got no slip uh, on, the, on the substrate, and we've got uh, free shear at the, at the interface. And uh, in heat transfer, because the flow is very uh, slow, we've got what is called a small pickle number flow, and basically it means that it's dictated by diffusion only. And therefore, the temperature profile is very simple. It's effectively a linear temperature profile across the, across the thickness, where the, the temperature is equal to Ts on the surface, and we've got cooling from the surrounding atmosphere um, with a convectivity transfer coefficient here. So this is, these are the building blocks of the, of the, of the model. And uh, at, uh, I guess the main thing I want to show, which is the, 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 end, the end equations, looks like this. So it shows the rate of change of the, the film thickness, and this is related to the divergence of uh, flux here. And the main thing I want to show you is that this flux is a function of this vector quantity k, and this vector quantity k is the quantity that involves all the information about the orientation of the surface relate, related to, to, to gravity. Okay? So we solved this, uh, this problem on a circular domain. We, we use a finite element for that. And um, um, what we do initially, the non-control case, we put a little bit of fluid in the middle and let it spread uh, on its own. So it, because it's, uh, it would, the non-control case is basically a flat surface, it spreads purely radially. And this is what we've got uh, here. So we see the, 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 the fluid here which uh, spreads outwards, and it spreads radially because we've got a flat uh, surface. So this is the uncontrolled case. And in order to measure the, the ultimately, we're interested in the, the uniformity of the, of the coverage. So this is measured by this uh, objective function, we call it, which basically um, is a measure of how far the film thickness h 
is from the uniform, uh, uniform value. Okay? So I'll just show you a couple of examples. One of them, you could call it fast cooking. This is the blue curve here. And so the, um, this objective function decreases, of course, because as, uh, as the fluid spreads, it becomes more and more uh, uniform. But then it starts to solidify. And when it solidifies, obviously, it slows, slows the, the spreading. And this is why the, the fast cooking uh, does not become as uniform as the slow cooking. Because slow cooking, it, it is, um, because it's slow cooking, the, the, the viscosity uh, remains lower for longer, and therefore it spreads, uh, it spreads more. Okay? So this is what I refer to as the uncontrolled case, because basically all we do is put that, uh, if you think about the, the, the pancake again, we put the butter in the middle, let it spread, and if you had a, a hot pan, it would cook before it spreads completely on the surface. Okay? So what we're trying to do now is um, to find the best way of moving our surface to spread the, 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 the fluid uniformly on the, on the, on the surface. So, so we are trying to minimize this, um, this objective function. And the first thing we, we try to do is just say, well, OK, let's, uh, let's take the simple kind of uh, kinematics that we can Im imagine. And this is, this is described by those functions here, which are simple harmonic functions. And uh, those harmonic functions have got uh, four unknowns, which are the amplitudes of the rotation and the period of the, of the rotation. Okay? And the first thing we did is use a Monte Carlo method um, with console as a simulation tool and, um, and uh, let it run for a long time. So after about 2,000 um, runs, so 2,000 uh, realization of uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, uh, this is what the optimal angle sort of uh, look like. So that, that probably doesn't mean uh, a lot. I guess what I would like to show you is this, this video. So this video will, will basically shows you um, how the fluid would spread on the, on the surface. And clearly, you see initially it becomes red here. The fluid goes to this side and then moves around on the, on the surface. And, um, of those uh, 2,000 uh, realizations, so what we see again coming back to this objective function, so the, the, the blue is the fast cooking, and that's what we're trying to optimize. And the, the best of all the Monte Carlo um, realization is this, uh, this curve here, which is um, sort of reddish and dash and dot dash sort of a curve. So, OK, clearly we see an improvement, so that's good. In fact, because it's on a log scale, it's quite a big improvement. We can improve the uniformity by, by a factor of three here. So that's, that's, that's a, that's, that is a good start, but, um, but we want it to do better. Um, and uh, in order to do better, we need um, to be able to evaluate um, when you do optimization. Um, it's always useful to have uh, information about the uh, the gradients of the objective function in the parameter space. So this is, so this is uh, our objective function, which we try to minimize here. And these are our uh, um, parameters, if you like. And you know, uh, basically, the Monte Carlo methods, what it does, it just samples almost randomly all this parameter space and try, try to get the best um, uh, the value of the parameters to get the minimum. But as we know, you know if I were to put a uh, roll bearing on this surface, it would naturally roll to the minimum because it's got information about the surrounding and it knows to go in the steepest decent direction. So this is what we, what we want to be able to do, evaluate the, the gradient of the objective function with respect to those parameters theta and beta. Now it's not, it's not an easy thing to do because theta and beta are not just parameters, they're actual functions. So uh, calculating those sensitivities with respect to a function is, is, um, is, is something that uh, is not straightforward, but we've used uh, a method which is called the adjoint, uh, adjoint methods that allow us to, to calculate precisely how our objective function depends on those, um, uh, on those controls, basically. And uh, basic, so what the animation that you see here is the, is the very op optim uh, optimum of the the kinematic of the surface in order to spread the, the, the liquid uniformly on the su surface. And um, I think the, 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 the flow that you observe is probably quite naturally the kind of flow that you would actually do when you, if you're doing your own pancake. You try to get, reach the edge of the, of the pan and then um, have the fluid rotate around. 
Now, this, this technique, this algorithm that we've developed, um, actually allowed an improvement of, in uniformity of, um, so if you compare this dashed line, which is the uncontrolled case, with the blue line, which is the optimum that we found, you, we can in, improve the informity, uniformity by a factor of 10. And this is what we, what is, what we see here. This is the uncontrolled case, leaving the, the surface flat. And you see that only in a little ring, uh, basically the, what we see in color is where the, the thickness is within plus or minus 5% from the optimum. So when it's uncontrolled, there's only this small area here that is plus, within plus or minus 5%. When it's uh, optimized, we see that a lot more of the, the, the film is within that, uh, those bounds. So that's, um, that was the, the main point of this. Now, something I've learned in doing that is that when it comes to uh, scientific literature, people are much more interested in when he talks about food and food science. <laughs> this, this paper that we published now, uh, probably uh, three years ago, um, has been mentioned in Nature, in science and all those things. So that, that was, a, that was a, not something I was expecting, but um, a lesson for the future. Now, uh, coming back to the, um, where, where we're heading with this. So with this ability to, to coat surf, so we've shown that we can coat flat surfaces with a uniform uh, liquid layer. What we'd very, very much like to be able to do is to do the same on curved surfaces. In, because in fact, uh, much of the microelectronics industry is reliant on the ability to coat um, silicon wafers uh, with, with photoresist. Okay? Uh, if, you, um, if you were able to do that reliably on, on curved surfaces, well, all of a sudden you could do your um, you know, printed circuit board on curved surfaces. Uh, you could do your solar panel on, on curved surfaces. So, so, um, so we're, we're working at the moment on um, applying the techniques that I've just described to you on, uh, on curved surfaces. Um, so, um, in conclusion, so we've basically developed a mathematical model which describes the, the, the fluid dynamics of, the, of a film on a, on a, a non-isothermal film on a, on a surface. And we've shown that it's possible to improve the liquid coverage by a fine-tuning of the, the kinematics of, the, of the, the substrate. And we've also shown that this uh, optimization technique based on the adjoint uh, calculations of the sensitivity is a massive improvement uh, on the Monte Carlo. Something I've not mentioned is that in Mont for the Monte Carlo optimization, we needed 2,000 simulations. For the, the, the adjoint sensitivity, we only needed um, about 100. So, so this allows you to solve those optimization problems much, much um, faster. Um, if you will, I, I, can I just have another three no, minutes? Yeah, OK. Because I, I, I just would like to spend, it, it, it won't, I won't be very long, but because this is the, the project I've been working on with, uh, with Professor Ho here at, uh, at WITS, I, I just wanted to say a few words about, uh, about what we've been doing. And it, again, it's related to um, uh, the optimal control of the flow um, around uh, surfaces using computational fluid dynamics. And, um, Basically, the, 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 the control, the, the, the context is that, uh, as you all know, when, when we've got uh, flow over uh, surfaces, especially curved surfaces, um, we, we, we may have separation and uh, separation of the flow. And this separation, of course, has a lot of uh, undesirable uh, consequences. Uh, this separation uh, leads to uh, increased drag, decreased lift, um, and decreased contra controllability. Um, some of you might rec recognize this is this is old footage, but this is the Tacoma Bridge uh, that collapsed uh, because um, uh, of a growing instability uh, due to the, the the fluid structure interaction on the, uh, on the uh, on the bridge. Um, so, um, and of course, um, in aerodynamics or, or aerospace, the, this the separation leads to poor aerodynamics performance um, on uh, on your on your airfoils for your. Or your lifting or your controlled surfaces uh, in diffusers, separations of course is also um, uh, counter counterproductive. Um, so what we what we've been working on so, so this is a project um, that um, 
We co supervised with Professor Ho, and um, uh, this, this is mostly the, the, the work of uh, our PhD student, James Ramsey. Uh, but uh, so basically, we, the, in the flow control problems that we looked at, um, in fact, we, were lo we looked at controlling the flow around a cylinder, which actually, strictly speaking, is more challenging than a, than a, than a streamlined body like, a, like an airfoil. Um, and um, we looked at controlling the flow using suction or blowing across the wall of the, of the cylinder. So this is what we see here. And the, this is the cylinder, and we are applying suction or blowing across the, the cylinder. Our, the output that we are looking for is the, the aerodynamics load. So for example, that may be to decrease the, the drag. Um, we use uh, CFD as our sensor, if you like, um, basic, because basically we run the simulation, see what happens, and then change the control. And, and we use uh, optimization again, that's a recurrent theme, to, um, to basically find the, the optimal um, suction of, and blowing that uh, maximizes the aerodynamics performance of the, of the body. Um, so I'll just show you this video, which I think illustrates nicely uh, what we've managed to do. So this is the classical uh, Volkermann streets or vortex shedding that, uh, that occurs uh, downstream of a, of a cylinder. You recognize this. And at a certain time, you'll see a growing region here on this cylinder, and this is where we apply the suction. And as you apply the suction, in fact, the, the, the red region is very small because, in fact, we don't need a lot of suction. You see that we are able to uh, completely reattach the, the boundary layer and, and, uh, and therefore si um, stop the, 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 the vortex shading. The, the consequence of this and, uh, is that when you look at the total drag of the, uh, of the cylinder as a function of the Reynolds number, um, the dashed line in black here is the, the uncontrolled case, so the classical uh, uh, drag coefficient for, for a cylinder. And the, the, the purple curve here that you see is the, the, the control case with applied suction. And um, again, here you see that the, the, we managed to reduce the drag coefficient by, by, uh, by a substantial amount. Um, almost an order of magnitude here because this is, in a, this is in a, on the log scale. Um, so this is, uh, th there's still a lot of things to do. Uh, as, um, so with uh, including looking at uh, higher speeds, so higher Reynolds number, or Mach numbers. Um, an important thing, of course, is how to apply practically and in a controlled manner the, the suction and the blowing. Um, Doing some lab testing on this is also on the on the agenda, and uh, something that uh, that we are currently working on, and uh, that's uh, that's an important area of application, is um, use this suction and blowing to mitigate cavitation on the hydrofoil, and uh, therefore, um, you know, uh, allow, allow, allowing 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 sorry, um, yachts to go to travel faster. Um, so that concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Um, uh, if you can go back to the yeah. um, Can you go back to your optimization and uh, input problems for the geometry? Sure. Yeah. Which uh, one precisely do you want? Yep. This one. Um, we, we can plug it, plug it in straight. So something I've not talked about is um, actually an important thing of what we've done is derive some simplified model actually based on uh, something that is called a lubrication approximation that basically sort of capture 99% of the dynamics but uh, 
at one percent of the the cost, the computational cost. And so, so, so in this simpli and in this simplified model, um, yeah, we can calculate. We basically use the the free surface velocity straight from the from the model. Is 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 that the, your question? Yeah. I see. Yeah, because um, maybe you're um, referring to the fact that when you look at it from above, I mean, you, you've got multiple components of the velocity. One component is going to be um, downwards or upwards, uh, but 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 in fact, we we're just looking at the component of the velocity that is uh, in the in the plane, basically. Uh, yeah, and that was sufficient to. To recover the, the rheological parameters. Yeah. Okay, I'm just an engineer. Uh, this company is based on that. First of all, you, uh, because you use analytical methods to deal with your analysis and your engagement, right? Uh, secondly, uh, are you sticking with the power law, not the reality, because it's easy to work with, or because there's some practical reasons? I mean, what about logarithmic non-linearities? Yeah. Uh, and thirdly, <laughs> I have a dream <laughs> to be a barista someday. And when you produce those pancake things, I mean, I'm sure there must be some work done in terms of uh, producing the patterns on lattes, for example. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. And I think you might have certain, certain references in nature in the future for, if you go on that road. <laughs> Interesting idea, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so the first one was to do with uh, analytical solution. No, it's pretty rare because you end up with some equations which are very nonlinear, highly coupled, and uh, it would be, well, it would be quite unusual unless you make a lot of assumptions about the, the nature of the flow and the, the geometry that, that you can actually get uh, some sort of analytical form. Um, I mean, no, I, I, it's not... Um, Actually, actually, it's not completely excluded. They, 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 they are, in fact, there's a famous paper where the, the authors basically looks at um, um, like gravity currents just spreading radially. So basically, it's just like a, a bit of fluids that you put on the surface, and you look at the rate at which it spreads. And there, are, there, are, there are some analytical solutions that are possible that that can be used sometimes to say something about the rheology. Yep. So that, that was the first question. Uh, the second one was about the power law. Oh, yeah. So the, 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 actually, the, well, the power law describes, well, it comes down to, so the power law is a very standard biological law that is uh, used uh, quite, quite, quite commonly. And actually, if I go back to this, OK, th this graph here kind of shows the, the whole spectrum, if you like, of rheological uh, Behavior that are typically observed. Okay, it's not every, every behavior, but it, it's a lot of them. And rheological law allows you to, to capture those three. So that, that's already a lot of them. And the, the, those two up here cannot be captured because they, they they've got what's called a yield stress, which is this jump that we see here. So the, so the the power law is kind of a nice starting point because it captures a lot of what's observed in uh, in real life. Oh, the lattes, yeah. yeah. So, like, well, uh, but uh, there, there, there would be a lot of, um, actually, uh, these are fun problems to work on, so. Uh, I mean, for, for practical reasons, it might be a bigger problem because you've got a fluid on a fluid. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I do not think it would be an easy problem to solve. I suppose, you, in theory, you could extend that to, uh, I'm going to speak like a mathematician now, to all Riemannian manifolds, in other words, got a lot of, with, with varying curvature as you go along. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, those students that have done second year mathematics with us, <laughs> we speak a lot about curvature and changing yeah. curvature and so on, and maybe there's a wealth of information that can oh, come yeah, up. Yeah, 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 yeah,
looking at uh, surfaces that um, are more complex than the, than the, than the sphere or you know, a single radius of curvature. <coughs> Going, going back to the lava flows, I know nothing about this at all, but I would imagine that the viscosity uh, depends on the temperature of the lava as well. So do, yep. do, you ha do you have to have some form of assumed temperature distribution or can you calculate that? Yeah, so we, we well, in fact, this is, this is what you see here. Uh, it, those coefficients are indeed uh, functions of, uh, of, of, of temperature. And so, so there's... Yeah, I mean, uh, our models um, uh, account for, for, for the temperature, but usually we do have to make some assumptions about how those coefficients depend on temperature. But often it's Arrhenius, often it's an Arrhenius relationship, and, and therefore you can, uh, it introduces more parameters, but uh, there's, there's a well-known sort of correlation there. that you have and that you, you predict from the observations, what sort of accuracy, or is it impossible to tell an accuracy because you don't have a datum uh, value to compare against? Nobody's measured yeah. lot lava in a lab. Yeah. Or have they? Um, oh, they, they are. It's possible. No, it's definitely possible. Well, I mean, uh, there, there, are, there are some reference uh, points. In fact, yes, they're, they're, so, so it can be... Um, I mean, there's very specialized equipments that have been used to, to measure la la lava rheology, so, 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 so it, it is available. The problem is that it's uh, dependent on so many things. You know, different eruptions, different day, you would probably get a different, um, different parameters. Um, so, so, um, but, um, I mean, what basically allows us to, to say, well, you know, sort of ground proof a little bit our methodology is to do those twin experiments I was talking about, because you, 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 can, you can always, um, so for example, you can always use a, um, um, you know, known parameters, get the simulation, put a lot of noise on, on, onto those results, and then see what the addition of noise, um, see how the addition of noise affects the results that you observe. So, so this gives you some measure of uh, how, you know, if you're not very accurate in your measurement, how it's going to affect the, the results that you that, that you that you obtain, and um, so that, that that is that is one way. And I guess ultimately, um, this is why this is why we work a lot with various uh, simulants, uh, different fluids that would uh, have behaviors that mimic lava in some uh, in some ways, and but that we can still characterize well enough, um, and then. Um, if we've done that often enough, that allows us, that gives us confidence that when we do it on lava, that's, uh, that's going to give us uh, some so stability. Could you say, you know, you can't get better than 10%, you know, this stuff is never closer than 10%. Yeah, okay. And, uh, but maybe you're so talking about magnitude. Yeah, yeah. if I had to give a number, I'd say that uh, so on true lava, if we were able to predict it, uh, it's guesswork a little bit, but within 20%, I would be happy. of uh, uh, moments and initia. I just saw some um, derivations that you, you, you projected. Um, what was the main reason for you to actually uh, come to that conclusion or come to that, uh, that ideology of con conservation of uh, moments and... Yeah. I mean, uh, these are... These are the building blocks of any uh, the conservation of mass and momentum. Uh, every time you look at a fluid flow, would be your 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 basic building blocks, if you like. Uh, but then uh, then there's other things that that we did uh, because um, sorry, where was I? Um, because the flow is very viscous. I think I think maybe this is where you were referring to. Uh, because the flow of the material we're looking into is either very viscous or very thin, and all the terms to do with inertia in those equations basically uh, disappear, which makes it easier, and which means that we can find some equations which are much cheaper to solve than the, the full equations. Okay. Um, I'm just actually uh, facing an, a challenge also because I'm actually doing a research 
but uh, I was actually trying to uh, derive some some formulas wherein I still have two unknowns and I do not know where to actually take the approach because I had you actually picking some some values uh, that's what that's what I actually thought maybe that I could actually get some values online and actually reference them and pick some values uh, it was actually uh, in terms of the the sleep okay yeah so that's why I'm actually asking about the conservation because maybe I could actually incorporate such also in my research yeah so the, the, the sleep is typically something that is very difficult well uh, well it's not always easy to measure so so yeah it might be something that you can uh, you might be able to use similar ideas to infer what values of sleep need to be in order to match your um, observations with your with your simulations. Mm. Uh, last question. Um, with your suppression of vortex shedding with the cylinders. Yeah and you can suppress the weight shedding with suction and you've shown that you get a reduction in the drag coefficient. In terms of net energy savings, so you know, you've, you've got a bit of energy which you're trying to save from reducing drag but you're putting in the suction, is there net gain? Um, yeah, uh, that's a good question and uh, in fact, yeah, because uh, that's uh, often the argument, yeah, well, if, the, if the cost, the energy cost of doing that is uh, Higher than the, the energy saving from the from the drag, but um, so yeah, we've done some estimate and and, and yes, uh, especially with the because they, they, they are especially with the, the optim, optimal sort of suction that we uh, we came up with. In fact, the, the amount of suction that's required is is, uh, and is, is, is is not very substantial. So so it, from our 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 calculation suggests that yes, you would you would still be um, you know, better off from an energy point of view. Could you liken that as, as, as um, to uh, prolonging the laminar flow of the state because the top half of that graph was the laminar part yeah. and you're kind of pulling it down and, and pushing the, the boundary where turbulence starts further down, further to higher Re Reynolds numbers. Yeah. Is that what you're doing? Is it, is it, is it Basically, you, you're sustaining a laminar flow for longer than naturally would. Uh, yeah, 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 pretty much. So basically, by 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 stopping the by stopping the, the separation. Um, I mean, the, something I should make it clear. I mean, all, all those were very low. They were low Reynolds number. So we're still looking at um, with with this is kind of future work. Looking at how to apply. This methodology to, to to turbulent flow, but yeah, if, if effectively, so so the cases I've presented because they are laminar. I mean, they are laminar; they remain laminar, but you still stop the transient flow because the the separation uh, is uh, prevented. And if you add um, if you add a turbulent flow, so a much higher Reynolds number, yes, that that is what you would be doing. You would basically allow the the laminar boundary layer to remain laminar over. Uh, a larger uh, portion of the cylinder. Sucking out, thinning down the, the boundary layer so it starts again as it were. Yep. It starts thin. Yep. What will be the application for the cylinder in a turbulent flow space? What, what example will that be? Well, I guess the, the cylinder was was a lot to sort of demonstrate the, the principle because if we can do it on the cylinder, we can do it on the streamlined body, like an like an like an airfoil or a hydrofoil. But but still, a cylinder actually um, cylinders and cross flow um, are subject to a lot of vibration because of the, the vortex shedding. So actually, if you were able to, you know, um, by by such controls. Uh, stop the, the vortex shedding, then you would stop those vibrations, and that, that would uh, probably increase the lifetime of, uh, um, of, of, your, of, your, of your cylinders, basically. You know, because you, you would stop this, you know, if you've got a cylinder that is held uh, um, in place, um, 
um, and you're able to, to, to stop the, the, the vibration, then you will stop the fatigue of the, of the support systems. So I'm actually a chemical engineering student and I re recently wrote an exam actually two days ago where we had to use the derived version of Navier-Stokes and then use it to derive a velocity profile for flow down a condensate fold. Um, so firstly, how is this, like those, those concepts applied in real life besides, like I know you've mentioned for example the pancake, um, that was quite interesting, food science. Um, but also coming back to, I saw you did the von Kármán vertex, and is that correct, the von Kármán? Um, so my question is basically, the Reynolds number, I know that as your Reynolds number increases, you have now your turbulent flow, and then you have those eddies that form due to the separation from the body. So um, in terms of your pressure distribution, now you have your blowing and suction. How does the blowing and suction influence your pressure distribution? Okay, so when, when we look at, for example, the, the flow of a, of a cylinder, um, there is the, there is, uh, for, for potential flow, so, so there is a well-known pressure distribution that is basically sort of a sine squared law. I don't, I, I don't know if uh, that rings a bell to people who have done potential flow here. Uh, but but so, 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 so basically, you've got you know, peak pressure at the leading edge, uh, and, and, and at the tra trailing edge, and uh, minimum pressure on the top and bottom. So, so when when we apply the suction and stop separation, we recover exactly this pressure distribution. So, so, so that that means to say that uh, uh, you know, basically, stopping the stopping the separation allows us to to recover this theoretical optimum, basically. Not sure if that answers your question exactly, but yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I am Posha Mugeta, the president for the current sitting of the National Council of the South African Institution of Mechanical Engineering. As an institution, we pride ourselves on continuing the journey that was started by John Orr. As mentioned by Prof. Reed, we continually get from him that knowledge that he wished to share with students um, and building the, the, the um, fraternity that is mechanical engineering. So this lecture for us um, is paramount to what we do as an institution, and we value each and every presenter who has ever presented for us at a John Hall lecture. We also value our relationship with the University of the Witwatersrand, as this allows us to continually build on the knowledge and the ideas that come from industry. So with all of that said, I would like to um, thank Prof. Celius and say to him, thank you for the small amount of time that you're in South Africa. You've agreed to give us this lecture and share some of the knowledge that you have gathered in your journey um, within this fraternity. And we appreciate it. We don't take it lightly. Um, and we hope that this continues to build your relationship with South Africa and with the various um, institutions of, of higher learning. Myself, for one, um, I didn't realize how much goes into a calculation of how to make the perfect pancake. And I think, <laughs> as you noted, um, the food journals um, are catching on to the theory that is developed within um, engineering, within any our technical research. And for that, thank you so much. And we look forward again to having you back um, in South Africa. Um, we'd like to share with you a token of our appreciation, um, which is just a simple certificate and hopefully a bag of goodies that you can, you can enjoy on your, <laughs> on your travels.
This one's a very special gift. <laughs> I think you can open the special gift. So just to, to um, end off from my side this lecture, I'd like to thank everybody that showed up here. I think your dedication to engineering is seen in how you show up at events like this, how you continue to build um, the engineering fraternity and how you continue to give back. Um, to those that joined online, we appreciate you as well. We hope that you learned a few things and that in future you will join us um, for snacks and drinks here. I think people don't know that we feed them, so please do show up and, and eat something. Um, this is the only way that we as industry research can come together and continue to to build on, on what research is being done and apply it within our, um, our various um, jobs and, and daily lives, as we can see with pancakes. So thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your support, and we hope to see you again next year as we continue in remembering the memory of John Orr. I think from here we can go outside for some snacks and networking and any more questions for Prof, I'm sure he'd be more than willing to, to chat and see how he can help you with your next venture in lattes and <laughs> yeah, thank you everybody, please join us for, for snacks.